Simple diagrams help us understand the relationship of spaces and their adjacencies. So the bubble will represent the space itself. It can be a living room, a kitchen, or a toilet. Try to treat bubble diagrams like mind maps. Mind maps are like um, ideas that are connected. It's the same thing with spaces in a, in a plan. So try to imagine an architectural project as a big idea and within it are smaller ideas. You have the idea for sleeping, the idea for eating, the idea for watching TV, and all of these things need to be interrelated. They need to be accessible with one another and they need to work as a, as a whole. That's why Le Corbusier, for a house typology, he thinks of it as a machine for living in. So all of these things are efficiently working and try to imagine bubble diagram as a flowchart of these activities. Whenever you're going to start a floor plan, there are three things that come to mind. User and space requirements given by the client. And then second are the dimensions or your familiarity with the sizes of each room. Normally, whenever I see a client and they have no idea how big uh, the spaces are because as architects, we are more technical about it and we are familiar with it as we go with experience. But with clients who are less technical than architects, they have no idea what a one meter by one meter is. So normally I would bring a mask and tape and then tape it on the ground. Let's say it's a one by one meter a space. I would demonstrate how big it is in actual space. So that way they have an idea what one meter is, what two by two meter is. And that way they have a sense of uh, scale. And then when you are showing a floor plan, they, have, they can project that idea into actual space and the third is site orientation and uh, i always make it a point that uh, uh, the bubble diagram is already adjusting to the site orientation but as a teaching professional i often see a lot of mistakes done by my students what are those the first one is that uh, they're all the same sizes they, there's no sense of hierarchy there's no sense of scale and proportion uh, I understand it's still on the idea stage, that's why it's still of the same sizes. But if you want to show an advanced version of a bubble diagram, I think it's better to show different sizes. Like uh, the living room will definitely be bigger than the powder room or the toilet, etc. So that way, uh, the reader will have a sense of scale when they are reading the adjacency diagram. And the second mistake I always see is that the bubble diagram always floats in space. What do I mean by that? Uh, yes, it's still an idea like a mind map, uh, sort of connecting um, the different spaces all together. At some point, you need to transport the bubble diagrams onto the site so that it's more relatable, that it's more responsive towards the conditions of the site. Especially when you're doing a lot of site analysis, you can already determine the locations of certain areas that are responding to a certain condition, such as noise from this side of the site, or probably a flood-prone area uh, side of the site. Uh, that way, uh, the bubble diagram is uh, already adjusting according to the conditions and towards the, the challenges of the site or the features of the site. And the third mistake I always see is that the bubble diagrams are just the major spaces. They don't include the support spaces. Uh, I know that it's the initial stage, but later on, uh, when you are advancing towards finalizing before going to the floor plan, you need to be more familiar with the support spaces because it can greatly affect the design. And um, whenever I see something that is lacking in support spaces, it reflects the lack of knowledge of, uh, of the student when it comes to the complexity of their project. Since I noticed these common mistakes, I realized some things and one of them is analyzing it if the bubble diagram is also a reflection of the hierarchy of spaces. Take the house typology for example. If you consider the house as a, as a, a place for living, uh, the living room takes center stage. Uh, it varies from client to client when it comes to prioritizing which is more important to them. When we talk about the typical house, the living room is actually one of the biggest room. It can, you cannot have a living room that is smaller than the toilet. And then you have the master's bedroom that can never be smaller than the guest room and even the smaller bedrooms. It's the same case with other programs such as say an office. Let's say it's a clerical or a production of documents. It's all about the production of work. And you have small spaces for those who are just managing uh, the employees. And then 
when you have a hotel, it's all about the spaces for accommodation. So collective, collectively, you have the spaces for uh, sleeping in. So it's a huge bulk of the building, and then the rest are support area, the museum space, wherein the bulk of the space should be about the galleries, wherein you showcase the art pieces, and then the others are support areas. So uh, that's how I'm starting to see that there, there is a hierarchy behind the spaces that we create and I tried seeing it like an org chart. It's, it's going to be a school, it's all about the learning spaces, uh, that's the, the main purpose of the typology and then the rest are supporting spaces and in the supporting areas they have their own hierarchy and uh, that hierarchy can ref be reflected on the sizes. If I go back to the house typology, you have the living living areas as the, the main priority but on the side uh, what makes this house uh, functional are the people that live in it so they have their own hierarchy uh, the, the parents who have the master's bedroom and then the kids that have um, smaller bedrooms and and the staff if they have a staff in their house uh, they have their own quarters as well of course the stakeholders for any typology will have needs and this will come as a support areas that again will have to be reflected in the diagram. Nowadays programs are evolving. Gyms or fitness centers, they have a cafe, they have a, a, um, a spa and then libraries have now uh, cafes as if you are in a shopping mall and now because of the pandemic all of these programs are going to change. Sometimes I'm exploring the idea of the bubble diagram as action words. Uh, probably we can use a, a, a bubble uh, for sleeping, a bubble for lounging around, bubble for working, and then all of these spaces can coexist. I notice there's also one thing that I notice with bubble diagrams. It's just two-dimensional. A student would ask me about a bubble diagram on a ground floor, and then he's having a dilemma if. He has to show the second floor and of course I said yes because it's still a two-dimensional plan and that is probably why a lot of uh, architects and designers are appreciating what Big or Bjarki sort of made famous which is diagramming because it's like a bubble diagram in, in 3D, 3D. And, and it's more advanced because it reflects the dimension, it reflects the, the volume of the space. You take it to the next level which is 3D, 3D diagram. That way, you have a, a sense of adjacency and relationship of spaces, not just on a horizontal manner, but in, a, like what Zaha had said, architecture is 360 degree. You can manipulate architecture on all different sides. Of course, in an ordinary project, it's more simplified. You just deal with 2D bubble diagram. And it really helps if you see it as like an org chart um, and not commit the three mistakes that I mentioned earlier which is basically not imagining the spaces in, in a blank space and providing an idea on the sizes and in relation to the other spaces and a bubble diagram that sort of transported to the site reacting and responding uh, to the conditions of the site and if the designer meets this minimum requirements I think there's so many ideas that can be done and if they treat it like a mind map or a, an org chart or a process of uh, doing something, I think it will enrich the project. And again, if you're more proficient with 3D diagram using blocks, um, I think it will be more helpful, it will be more complex, and you can manipulate the architecture more fluidly and create an interesting uh, program and experiences. This is also one way to demonstrate your thorough understanding of the org and the person you are designing for. I guess that's it for today because I want this mini lecture to be used by my students because there's an activity that they need to respond towards this video and and I hope you, you keep watching because uh, I, I try to make it more diary like so that you can witness our progression uh, me as a teacher and then my students as they grow in my studio. So uh, thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.